Hello, my friends. Welcome to my corner. If you ask me, Jorge, what authors should I read if I want to experience the beauty of the Spanish language? Of course, I would have to think about the question for maybe an hour or two, but I can tell you for sure that one of the names that would come to mind first would be that of the Cuban novelist Alejo Carpentier. He's one of those authors who are associated with what some people call the pre-boom. It's a label that I don't really like, as I have told you before, but it's a label that works for our purposes, at least in this video. So he is comparable to Miguel Ángel Asturias, to Juan Rulfo, to Juan Carlos Onetti, Jorge Luis Borges, all of those authors that are considered to be before the boom. Now, unfortunately, outside of Latin America, not many people read Alejo Carpentier, and I think that is highly unfair. So here's what happened. This year, Penguin decided to publish a new translation of his most famous novel, which is Los Pasos Perdidos, or The Lost Steps. And that is just a wonderful excuse for me to talk about this novel. So that's what I wanted to do. Now, before we look at the novel itself, let's look at some context here. Alejo Carpentier published six novels and three novellas in the period that goes from 1933 to 1979. All of them are excellent, all of them deserve our attention, but he's primarily known for his novella, at least I consider it to be a novella, El Reino de Este Mundo, or The Kingdom of This World. This was my introduction to his work. I read this novel twice in college, one time for a class that I took in English, another time for a class that I took in Spanish, and in both cases I had to give a presentation about this novel. So I felt like, this novella, sorry. So I felt like it was following me, like Alejo Carpentier himself was telling me, you need to read me. So I'm really happy that that's the way it happened. I have a very personal connection to the kingdom of this world. But then the last steps, as I was saying before, Los Pasos Perdidos, is his most famous novel. So we're looking for a novel proper, this would be it. And then there's a short story titled Viaje a la Semilla, or Journey Back to the Source. The literal translation of Viaje a la Semilla would be Journey to the Seed, but it was translated in English as Journey Back to the Source, which is a very important short story. It's about a man who goes back in time. He goes from being old back to being a child. So you could see almost a connection there with the strange case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald. And there's also a short story by the sci-fi author from here from the US, Damon Knight. I don't know if you have heard of him, but he is famous primarily for his short story To Serve Man, which was turned into that wonderful Twilight Zone episode. But anyway, he has a story titled Backward O Time, and it's exactly the same idea, this person who experiences time backwards. It's very important, Viaje a la Semilla, or Journey Back to the Source, especially if you're planning to read Los Pasos Perdidos or The Lost Steps. So I highly recommend that you check out this famous story by Alejo Carpentier. Let me show you some of the books that I have by him. This is his first novel, Eque Jean Bao, which translates as Praise Be the Lord. It is a Negrista novel, so that's how he began by writing in the vein of Negrismo, which is a, uh, an avant-garde movement in Latin American literature. I also have this really short novella, Concierto Barroco. Uh, this one is about the uh, opera by Vivaldi Motezuma, so it revolves around that. It's about music. Alejo Carpentier was big on music, as you will see if you read The Lost Steps also, but he was a theorist and a historian when it came to music also. And then the other one that I have here is El Arpa y la Sombra, which is his last novel, and this one revolves around the figure of Christopher Columbus. By the way, all of these covers that you see here, they are taken from the paintings of Wifredo Lam, a wonderful Cuban artist that I encourage you to look up and to look at his works. That's one thing that I like about this publisher, Alianza Editorial. They always took works of art for the covers that were directly related to the authors and to the works that were being presented. So let me go back a little bit to El Reino de Este Mundo, the first uh, book that I read by Alejo Carpentier. This is a chronicle of the Haitian Revolution. And the interesting, th interesting thing about it is that it has no protagonist. So it is presented to us as a series of events all dealing with the Haitian Revolution. Now, The Lost Steps is something different because here we do have a protagonist. He is also the narrator and he remains nameless throughout the story, which I always think is interesting when an author decides not to give us the name of the character. Most of the time that means that that element, that the lack of a name, is something that we should explore. 
So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story now. Okay, the story opens in London, and you can tell from the very start that this narrator is somebody who's just jaded and in desperate need of a change of air. Okay, his life in London is completely humdrum. He basically uh, can't get no satisfaction from anything, okay, like not from his friendships, not from his work, not from his married life, nothing. But a change happens when he is commissioned to go to the Latin American continent in search of an indigenous musical instrument. And of course, he decides to go because he really has nothing to lose there in London. He travels with Mush, okay. Mush is a woman whom he describes as a friend. But you can tell that she is actually uh, quite, uh, she's more than that, okay? So keep her in mind, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about her in a few minutes. So as soon as they arrive to the American continent, there is a violent revolution right there that breaks out right in front of their eyes. So we already have that contrast right there, his humdrum existence in London versus this excitement with this revolution that happens as soon as they arrive. But eventually they are able to embark on this journey. They are going along a river Okay, that is very important. We have here the Orinoco River, basically. And they go in search of this indigenous instrument. And along the way, they meet a lot of typical characters. For example, there's a Greek miner who carries with him a copy of the Odyssey. And actually, if you look at the novel, uh, at the end, there is a note by Alejo Carpentier. And he says that all of these people are real. Okay, these are people that he actually met in real life. And uh, he says specifically about the Greek miner that he did not even change the name here. Baste decir que el autor no ha modificado su nombre siquiera. So he even used the same name uh, as the real person to show you how real these characters are. There's also a priest, there's a herbalist, and then we have, of course, the beautiful Rosario. More to come about her also. So their journey basically mirrors the quote-unquote discovery of the American continent, the colonization would be a better word here. That is what The Lost Steps is about. It is a journey back to the origins. It is a journey in which the characters, especially the narrator, is tracing back his steps, right? Retracing his steps. Uh, there you have the connection with the title, of course, The Lost Steps. And as they enter this primordial place, this jungle, right? What they experience is the passions, the desires, the impulses that are latent in the human heart. So it is really a story about discovering that darkness of the human heart. Now, a word about the style, okay? The word that you're going to find used to describe Carpentier's style the most is Baroque, and I think it fits, okay? His style is Baroque, that is the style of his prose, and it is just meant to be savored. Here's what happened to me when I was reading this. Uh, I found myself, there was this irrepressible urge to start reading out loud, okay? I, I could not, the, the words just refused to, to stay here on the page. They had to come alive, and I found myself reading out loud, but there's more to it. The, the problem was that at moments while I was reading these words out loud, I realized that I was not paying attention to the meaning because the words, the, the prose itself, were just so exquisite, okay, that I, that I would just lose myself in the rhythm, in, in the mere sounds, which were just so enthralling, right? So I had to go back and say, okay, Jorge, what did you just read? Like, what is going on here in the story or in this journey that the characters are experiencing? Because the style itself, was so delicious that I just couldn't help, you know, focusing simply on the sounds and the poetry and the music. And I think in, in this case that is a good thing, okay, when you lose track of the meaning because the sounds are just so amazing. There are many connections that you're going to find as you read The Lost Steps, and I'm pretty sure because of some of the things that I have already said that you may have made a connection with a text that is really close to my heart, and that is, of course, Joseph Conrad's novella, Heart of Darkness, which was my first video, my first real video that I did here on YouTube. And um, in a way, I, I like to describe Carpentier's The Lost Steps with no exaggeration as a rewriting and maybe an expansion of that novella by Joseph Conrad. If you look at it this way, you have a, an English character, an English protagonist and narrator here, who travels to the heart of a wild land where he comes to learn more about himself. So you can see many connections already with that. And then uh, his return is marked, you know, once he goes back to Europe, 
by that inadaptability, that sense of not being able to go back to society once you have confronted this dark side of your own self, that idea that you cannot go back home, which is something that I explored in that video on Heart of Darkness also. But you can find this here in The Lost Steps too. And um, just like when you read Heart of Darkness, you know, reading The Lost Steps is really to penetrate this thick jungle of language, of history, of the human psyche, of human desires, and all of the darkness in the human heart. But there's another connection that I wanted to make, a connection that I made before in a previous video when I talked about a very important Argentine novel. I am referring to Antonio Di Benedetto's Sama. Okay? Here you have another novel that deals with a character that confronts himself in the American continent. And it also features an existentialist type of approach. That is one word that you're going to see used to refer to both of these novels, Sama and The Lost Steps, existentialist. And the language is beautiful in both cases. And also in both cases you have a novel that focuses on introspection and on the language itself versus focusing on plot or storytelling. Now one important aspect of The Lost Steps that I wanted to cover or comment upon is the depiction of women. Okay? As I told you before, there are many connections with Heart of Darkness and with Conrad as a whole, and this is one example, the depiction of women. As you may know, Conrad has been criticized by many critics for the way that he portrays women. And in this case, we have um, the narrator's wife, Ruth. She's an English actress who does not, does not mind playing the same character over and over and over again. And to the narrator, what that says is, okay, this is a symbol of just the monotony of our life together. Then we have Mouche. I already told you about her. She is the quintessential French liberated woman, in this case with an interest in astrology. And the narrator basically uses her to satisfy himself. Okay, he has no respect for her. He thinks that her trade is just a scam. So the connection there is not very good either. And finally, we have Rosario. She is the local woman. She is the woman who has not been encumbered or, or molded by European rationalism. So you can see what Carpentier is doing here. The European women from different cultures, right? The English and the French versus the local American woman. I'm afraid I would have to say that the women in The Lost Steps are really caricatures. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that Carpentier is not a good narrator or that he's not good at portraying women or characterizing women. Another way to look at this would be to say that maybe it's because of the narrator. Remember that we have a protagonist narrator is the one who is turning them into caricatures. This is the way that he perceives them. And that is one of the many reasons that you may find here in The Lost Steps that we have at the center a character that is just not very easy to sympathize with. That is not surprising at the same time because we are talking about a novel that has been described as existentialist. And as you know, existentialist novels don't really focus on heroes, but on anti-heroes, rather. They are complex, they are interesting, we care about them, but at the same time, they are not exactly easy to sympathize with. You can think even of Sama as a, an existentialist type of anti-hero, and many other characters, even in novels that happen to be completely different, like, for example, Ernesto Sabato's The Tunnel. So keep that in mind, that dynamic, when it comes to the depiction of women and also about the way that we feel about this protagonist narrator. Another important thing that has to be highlighted when we talk about Alejo Carpentier is the idea of lo real maravilloso, the marvelous real. You know how Garcia Marquez is associated with magical realism. Alejo Carpentier has his own thing, and he called it lo real maravilloso or the marvelous real. Now, what is this thing, right? What is the marvelous real? The best place that you can go to get the words from Carpentier himself is to the introduction of El Reino de Este Mundo, or the kingdom of this world. He tells you here exactly what he means by this real maravilloso or marvelous real. And in a nutshell, what he does is basically to compare the marvelous quality of the American continent and life in the American continent itself with the aesthetic type of magical kind of thing, the striking images that you would find in something like surrealism. So on the one hand, you have an ontological quality, a quality that is part of the very nature of the place, of the American continent. And on the other hand, you have an aesthetic quality, something that is forced, if you will. In other words, just to put it very, very briefly, you have on the one hand something that is real, 
that is genuine and according to Carpentier on the other hand something that is fake with surrealism and all those avant-garde movements that used this concept of the magical or the marvelous. So the next question you may have is Jorge what is the difference then between the marvelous real and magical realism? Well do you have a couple of hours? It's a very complex issue but I'm just going to try to say a couple of things about it that I believe will help us to come to some sort of understanding of this. The first thing that I want to say is that critics really do not agree on this. Some people will actually tell you magical realism, the marvelous real are just the same thing said in different words, right? I don't exactly believe that that is true and you just have to read Garcia Marquez and then read Carpentier to realize that that is not actually the case. If you ask me personally, okay, this is just my opinion, I believe that the marvelous real is more genuine than magical realism. And part of the reason for that is that magical realism was around for a much longer time, has been around for a much longer time because you can still find it, and so has had more time to become an aesthetic thing eventually, which is exactly what Carpentier was trying to avoid. But what I always tell people, you know, I tell readers who maybe do not have an inclination to read magical realism, if magical realism is too much for you, Try The Marvelous Real, because it's completely different, okay? Now, let me read you something from Wikipedia so that we can kind of, you know, go more in depth when it comes to this. So, it says here, and this is, let me tell you, this is the article on Arejo Carpentier. And talking about The Marvelous Real, it says, Whereas Garcia Marquez's works include events that the reader never mistakes for reality, rainfall of flowers, old men with wings, etc., Carpentier, for the most part, simply writes about extreme aspects of the history and geography of Latin America, aspects that are almost unbelievable, but that are, in fact, true. Now, there are many problematic things right here. For example, um, Carpentier simply writes about extreme aspects, etc., etc. That's simply right there. I, I, I would have taken that word out. I like the fact that they said, for the most part, because that qualifies the statement right there. And then he mentions, or the person who wrote this, aspects that are almost unbelievable, but that are in fact true. It's very interesting that we have in fact true, those two words together, but also we would have to look at what your uh, interpretation of the truth is. Like, what, what does something that is true mean uh, to you in this case? What, what do we define as the truth? But I would say that that statement, for the most part, gives you a pretty good introduction with reservations into what the marvelous real is but if you want the perfect illustration okay of the marvelous real that is to be found in the kingdom of this world okay and i'm referring to the episode in which makandal is about to be burnt at the stake so the question there is what happens to him is he burned alive or does he become an insect and fly away and escape and of course the a the answer to this question is both okay it depends on who you ask to the Europeans present, he is clearly burnt at the stake and he dies. But to the locals, he becomes an insect and he flies away, free. Okay, so very interesting. Carpentier gives us a split there in the perception. The Europeans are horrified that the locals are celebrating, but the locals are celebrating because they believe that he has escaped. From their perception, that is exactly what happens. So that is a great example of the marvelous real. And what you can see there that I think is very valuable in this case to get this dialogue going between marvelous real and magical realism is the ambiguity that Carpentier presents. If Garcia Marquez had written that scene right there, Macandal would have become an insect and, and flown away with, without so much ambiguity. But Carpentier tells you, look, it's more complex than it seems because it really depends on how you look at things, okay? We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. That is very, very important to understand in this case. So I wanted to kind of share that with you to see if we could point out the difference between these two types of writing. I don't believe they are the same thing, but it's very difficult sometimes to pinpoint the differences between those two. And I think the Macondal episode really, really uh, helps us when it comes to that. So, uh, bottom line, The Lost Steps is a masterpiece. I'm going to say that, but I do want to say this. I still believe that The Kingdom of This World is superior as a text, and it's probably a better place to start with Carpentier. If you haven't read him and if you're thinking, I would like to experience Alejo Carpentier, I would say The Kingdom of This World is probably your best option. 
It is a novella, so that means it is more manageable. It has a more interesting structure, if you ask me, or a more experimental one, because you don't really have a narrator. And also, it's a better example of the marvelous real. And that's one of the reasons why many people read Carpentier. That is not the only reason why we should read him. There's also the beautiful style, the Baroque style, that I was telling you about before. But if you want to experience the marvelous real, I would say it's a little bit better if you go with uh, the kingdom of this world, because it really exemplifies that in a more clear manner. Uh, there are other words, but other works, I mean, by Carpentier that we should consider, other than the ones that um, I have shown you before. For example, he has the novel El Siglo de las Luces, which was translated into English with a more interesting title. The title is Explosion in a Cathedral. And by the way, my friend Mike did a video on this one, so uh, check out that video if you want to hear more about Carpentier. I'm going to link it to the uh, description of, of this one. That is the story of, uh, it basically takes place in the time of the French Revolution, but in the American continent. So it's very interesting. And then Carpentier also wrote his own dictator novel, which is titled El Recurso del Método, translated into English as Reasons of State. So you can read that and compare it to El Señor Presidente by Miguel Ángel Asturias, The Autumn of the Patriarch by Gabriel García Márquez, Show El Supremo by Augusto Robastos, and of course Mario Vargas Llosa's uh, La Fiesta del Chivo. So great, great novels to, to compare to each other and to put to dialogue in that case. So if you're not sure okay, whether to uh, experience Carpentier or not, I would say yes, do it. But if you want to try an experiment to make it more interesting, I would say just grab any book by him, open it at random, and read out loud one page. Okay, and I think he passes this test. I believe that if you are not captivated by, by that, I think you can safely uh, move on to another author or maybe experience by him something short, like the short story Viaje a la Semilla or Journey Back to the Source, or maybe the novella The Kingdom of This World. So do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? That was my video on Alejo Carpentier's great novel Los Pasos Perdidos or The Lost Steps. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.